Ladies and gentlemen, I'll be talking about the protocols and ethics in hospitals with regard to persons with Down syndrome. Uh, briefly, over the, the overview, I'll talk about the status over the years, the legislations and the law that we have, the current scenario, the limitations, and the possible solutions that are there. Let me present to you the case of Baby Doe. The year was 1982 and the day April 9th in USA. A baby was born with Down syndrome. The baby had esophageal atresia, which means that the terminal end of the esophagus was not getting connected with the stomach. The controversy was to operate or not to operate. The case was then prepared for presentation to the US Supreme Court. And before the case could be heard, baby Doe died of dehydration and pneumonia at nine days of age on April 15th. The boy was denied treatment and food and water, not because the treatment was unreasonably risky, even in those days, the treatment could be done without much of a problem, but rather because he was intellectually disabled. The Baby Doe Law and Baby Doe Amendment came in as an amendment to the child abuse law in the US. Now, this is when people started taking uh, a look upon what is happening. The second is a case of heart transplantation. Sandra Jensen in 1995, a 34-year-old woman in, with Down syndrome, she had heart failure. She was denied heart transplantation despite being approved for the procedure by the California Medicaid. She had to go in for a lawsuit and she underwent a successful heart lung transplant only after the successful lawsuit. Historically, organ transplantation in persons with Down syndrome I considered a contraindication until the above landmark case. The third is a case of baby B. Baby B was a newborn with Down syndrome, had intestinal blockage, which would have been fatal unless treated. It was probable that if the operation was carried out, her life expectancy would be 20 to 30 years, as it was in those days. Her parents refused to consent to the operation. Being certain, that it would be in the interest of the child to allow the child to die rather than to live physically and mentally handicapped. But the doctor contacted the local authority who made the baby a ward of court and asked the court to authorize the operation. Though the court authorized this, the attending surgeon who respected the wishes of the parents declined to carry it out. And so the local authority went back to the courts. Briefly, what it was, while great weight ought to be given to the views of the parents, they are not the views which would necessarily prevail. And the court said, whether to allow an operation to take place which may result in the child living with 20 to 30 years as a mongoloid, it was known as mongoloid in those days, or whether to terminate the life of a mongoloid child because she had an intestinal complaint. Faced with that choice, I have no doubt that it's the duty of the court to decide that the child must live. This is a case of a doctor, Dr. Erder, a consultant pediatrician, had a newborn with Down syndrome. Fiercely rejected by his parents, the mother particularly felt the baby would be a strain on her family and her daughter, and was not anxious to keep him. She discouraged herself, discharged herself soon, and did not see the baby again. Dr. Arthur wrote on the case notes that the parents did not wish the baby to survive and directed that only nursing care be performed. Three days after birth, the baby died. And Dr. Arthur signed a medical certificate stating that the immediate cause of death to be bronchopneumonia with Down syndrome as the antecedent cause. But a member of the staff of the hospital communicated anonymously with the LIFE, that's an anti-abortion organization, 
which had Dr. Erdar interdicted for murder. After a post-mortem examination, Dr. Erdar was charged and sent for trial. Now, whether the Dr. Erdar's conduct was to set conditions where the child could die peacefully, or was it a positive act which was likely to kill the child? That was a controversy. At uh, Dr. Erdar's trial, medical witnesses testified that his conduct Conduct was in accordance with general medical practice. Though they seem to depend on the Handbook of Medical Ethics, it mentions, it only mentions that the case of severely malformed infants, the parents must decide. But the question is whether a child with Down syndrome is a severely malformed child. Now that is again subject to what different people think and say. Now coming to my own personal experiences, I started the Down syndrome press on the post in the year 2000. The reasons why I started, I'll be I'm giving in a separate lecture. Now, even after that was there, after a lot of publicity and propaganda, there were cardiac surgeons who refused to do a cardiac surgery. The reason they said was their workload was so high that they had to prioritize. So when the workload is very high and they have to prioritize, should they give priority to a child with Down syndrome? or to a so-called normal child. That controversy was there. There was still another case where the story of Tenny, my patient, who had a congenital heart disease with uh, a pulmonary hypertension. It was a mild hyper pulmonary hypertension and I asked the parents to get it operated. The surgeon was willing, but the parent somehow was not willing. Years later, the child got admitted under me with severe breathing difficulty and distress because the pulmonary hypertension had progressed. At that time, the father came to me and said, doctor, I'm prepared to spend any amount, do whatever you can. I can't see my child suffer like that. But it was too late. No surgery would have helped the child. And a few months later, the child expired. We had the National Trust Act, that is in India in 1999, uh, for the welfare of persons with autism, cerebral palsy, mental retardation, and multiple disabilities. to enable and empower persons with disabilities to live as independently and as fully as possible within and as close to the community to which they belong. We have the National United Nations Conventions on Rights of Persons with Disability, UNCRPD 2006. The purpose was to promote, protect, and ensure the full and equal enjoyment of all human rights and fundamental freedom by all persons with disabilities. And the countries were to guarantee that persons with disabilities enjoy their inherent right to life as on an equal basis with others, equal rights and advancement of women, girls, and disabilities. The CRPD further goes on to say, the affordable health care and programs are, should be provided to every person as it is given to all persons. And the persons with disabilities have the right to the highest attainable standard of health without discrimination on the basis of disability. There were 160 countries which signed that and the country which signed ratified uh, that they are legally bound to treat persons with disabilities as subject of the law with clearly defined rights as any other person. In India in 2016, we had the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act, RPWD Act, and its measures to provide free healthcare, barrier-free access and priority in treatment. Now, with all these acts and policies, let us look at what is the current scenario in the hospitals. Apparently, there's no discrimination. People are aware of it, giving equal access to healthcare. But look at the status in a crowded, resource limited third world government healthcare setup where the triaging are the given weight. Two people come in a normal child and a child with a disability or a person with Down syndrome. Now, when the resources are limited, the beds are crowded and the doctor is also stressed, who would get the priority? Would they have 
equal priority or they will be sidelined based on their disability. Now, this is again something which we have been seeing in recent times during the COVID times last year, where ventilators and oxygen were required en masse, and the ventilators were disconnected from older people and given to younger people so that they will live. And we have seen older people die because of the lack of oxygen or ventilator. Now, is that fair? Well, it's all a question which uh, we all have to think about. And what happens if in an ICU there's a shortage of bed? Who gets the priority? Are they permitted to jump queues when there's a long queue waiting to see the doctor? Well, in one of the medical colleges in uh, Kerala, they decided that any child with Down syndrome can jump queues and come straight away to see the doctor. Now, are there protocols for all these things? There's no national policy or protocols for the management of persons with Down syndrome in most of the countries. There are policies and protocols, but there's no national protocol. The Down Syndrome Federation of India, that is the DSFI, brought out a detailed protocol uh, with a medical passport for health in 2015. Dr. Rega Diamantran and I were involved in the formation of the medical passport. It is still available, but sparingly used. We need to create awareness amongst medical personnel and get the government involved. Only if you get the government involved, we can get the doctors involved. And that is something which you've got to propagate, communicate, and see that it is being done. A lot of medicines are given. You don't know why do you have these protocols. People give various medicines left and right because they don't have any, any specific cure with the medicine for Down syndrome. High dose vitamin C, selenium, zinc, B complex, amino acids, DHA, very popular now, DMSO antioxidants, omega-3 fatty acids, they're also very popular, thyroxin for brain stimulation, and drugs like pyracetam is labeled as an orphan drug for Down syndrome. It may be useful in uh, adults with the uh, brain trauma, but studies have shown that pyracetam has absolutely no benefit in a child with Down syndrome. The donipizil for Alzheimer's, that's also tried. There are a few studies which stated that it improved the cognition in children given to about 20 years, but then uh, it was not substantiated by other studies. Controversial surgeries are there. Uh, the tongue surgery, the height increasing surgery, a lot of other procedures, unethical trials, trials without proper clearance. Now, who is going to monitor all these things? There are alternative therapies, especially in India and the Oriental countries. Ayurvedic medicines, very popular. Homeopathic medicines, Yunani medicines, Oriental medicines and even medicines by quacks, they survive because the parents are really frustrated when the doctor tells that it cannot be cured, it can be, but it can be managed. So they are run out for pillar to post, hoping that one of these systems will be of help because these systems claim to cure the condition. Let me put to you a few terms for concentration. Futility. Now, what do you mean by futility of treatment? This discussed in the medical and ethics literature for quite a long time and supposed to be impossible to define. When a surgical procedure is technically cannot be performed, it is mentioned as futile. You cannot do it. Nobody can do it. Or it will not produce a desired physiological effect. There's no point. Your surgery, your surgery is successful. Your operation is successful, but the effect is not there. Or it is highly unlikely to be efficacious or is completely speculative and tired. You are trying to just try it up on us. So all these are termed as futile procedures, but it is still used to justify withholding activity or life saving treatment, stating that it is futile. So you don't do it. Another term is killing and letting die. Killing requires an action while letting die involves an action. Letting the patient die is acceptable in medicine only under two conditions. One is the medical technology or surgical procedure is futile, as I just uh, described, or the parents validly refuse the procedure, not that they the pro refuse the procedure, there should be a valid reason for that. If neither of these conditions are satisfied, let the person die, letting the person die could be viewed as morally as culpable negligence. Medical termination of pregnancy, MTP, uh, well, we have an MTP act in India, but then the question is who can terminate? 
when it can when can it be terminated where whose consent is required and what is the general opinion that again goes on many acts have come in after that and then to bypass that now they have the mr menstrual regulation it is just a different terminology for medical termination using a different technique and at an earlier age so really a week of gestation so what are our concerns with regard to down syndrome sterilization should we or should we should we have a tubal ligation should we have a hysterectomy because people said hysterectomy will prevent further menstrual cycle and then the child can be or the by caretakers can be are uh, relieved of taking care during the menstrual period how would vasectomy but they, all these do not prevent sexual abuse and teach them about sexually transmitted diseases and birth control measures those are what are required and when you do a, uh, ask for a hysterectomy are there what are the ethical issues the child cannot give consent the who is to give consent can you give consent for somebody who is intellectually disabled stating that the uterus can be removed these are all questions which have to be seriously thought about adoption the laws vary from country to country in india there are about 20000 prospective parents and only about 2000 children about 50% of the children for adoption have some sort uh, sort of a special need and there are 59 conditions of special children only 1.5% of children with special needs are adopted every year so dilemma is where ethics and the law diverge the day to day decision making in almost all circumstances remains in the domain of the family and caretakers with a normative practice to follow now what is the normative practice in the inclusion of the treating physicians reasonable medical judgment accommodates the normative practice now what is the treating physicians reasonable medical judgment so the law and practice conflict actions in the court usually provide guidance as we have seen the initial few cases which i explained they are children born to humans have the right to live and get the needed treatment as any other human that is the fundamental right so what is the solution ahead to take a decision that will better balance the legitimate interest of the child most important the parents the medical community and the society this should be a national protocol for management every country should have its own national protocol for management of children with disabilities and children with down syndrome in difficult cases even if you have a national national protocol if it lies in an ambiguous area there can be an institutional ethics committee an institutional ethics committee committee is very rigid in india and many other countries also because you got the uh, sanction or the approval of the national board of the national uh, audit committee and if that is not possible you can have a medical board which any hospital or any institution can form to discuss this and such other matters the role of the hospital committee is first verify that the best information is available and second that confirm the propriety of a decision and according to the parent is is it appropriate or not third resolve disputes among those involved in a decision and finally if you cannot come to a decision you can refer cases to public agencies when appropriate i would suggest getting the advice of a support of a support group would be very beneficial because they consist of groups of parents of uh, children or persons with down syndrome they will be able to give a more uh, realistic and practical look on this we can get the support of them and let the medical ethics committee decide on that based on the national policy so let's hope that in future this will not be a problem and every child will have the right to live as a normal human being thank you